Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. I'm with the University of Ottawa Laboratory for Paleoclimatology. I'm going to talk about the tipping points in the Earth uh, system, and there's, very, there's many of them. This schematic is from the uh, Potsdam Institute in um, Germany, and it divides up the tipping points in the Earth system into three uh, different areas. Cryosphere, um, the circulation patterns, both ocean and atmosphere, and the biosphere component. So let's look at the ones that are most familiar to people, the cryosphere entities. So Arctic sea ice. We're rapidly losing Arctic sea ice year round. We're going to have a year very soon when we have a blue ocean event. The models say this is going to be 2050 or 2060, but the observations show trends that are pointing to more like 2020, you know, within the next five years or so. Uh, losing Arctic sea ice in the summer by the end of the melt season, which would be September. Um, and then once it goes for the first year, subsequent years, feedbacks kick in and it's gone for longer and longer until it's gone probably year round within a decade or so. Once the Arctic sea ice goes, then the melt rate from the Greenland ice sheet will skyrocket, um, greatly raising sea level rise. As the Arctic sea ice goes and the Greenland ice sheet goes, the Arctic is getting darker and darker and darker, absorbing more heat in the, um, in the summers up there. Um, therefore, it lowers the temperature gradient to the equator, so the jet streams get wavier and wavier and broken up, and we get a huge increase in extreme weather events around the planet, like torrential rains leading to floods, droughts, um, and, and much stormier activity. Okay, so some other, uh, so, so there's also the uh, West Antarctic ice sheet and the East Antarctic um, ice sheet and basins. So sea level rise, um, the ice that's tied up in, on Greenland is, would raise sea levels seven meters globally when it goes. The West Antarctic ice sheet, which is ice that's floating on bedrock that's below sea level, so it's melting very quickly from warmer ocean waters underneath, uh, is good for another five meters of sea level rise. So that's five plus seven is 12 at about another 60 meters from East Antarctica. Also, as the planet is warming, the oceans are expanding and that raises sea level rise. That's been primarily responsible for the sea level rise up to now, um, but the poles are kicking in big time. Also, the ocean circulation patterns, um, as they change, they affect sea level rise. Okay, so we've covered the cryosphere here, but we also have methane clathrates that are that because of high pressure and low temperatures the methane forms in in these clathrate crystal patterns of frozen ice surrounding methane as these things saw the methane is released bubbles up can enter the earth's atmosphere and methane has a very large global warming potential it's uh, 34 over a hundred year time scale but it's it's uh, 86 on a 20 year time scale Although recent data from this year, a paper came out and it's showing that the methane global warming potential is more like 96 over 20 year time scale. I'll, I'll do a separate video on that. There's also the methane class rates in the Arctic. Um, and there's also primarily on the Eastern Siberian Arctic shelf, basically on the continental shelf surrounding the Arctic. So as the ocean water is warming, these methane class rates that are in the sediments under the seafloor are can, can be exposed to large amounts of heating and release. So this is where we get, you know, people are concerned about like a 50 gigaton burst of methane in the Arctic, say over 10 years, or you know maybe five gigatons per year you know, over 10 years, or a sudden release, and this would greatly increase the methane in the atmosphere, cause, causing huge, very very abrupt and rapid uh, rise in temperatures. Um, the Yodoma permafrost, the, the permafrost on land, okay, Yodoma, this is particularly in Siberia. There's also, it's also in the northern, northern Canada, um, in, um, you know, other regions, Alaska. Um, there's a lot of methane, there's a, there's a lot of organic material tied up in that permafrost. So when that thaws, bacteria breaks it down and in the absence of oxygen produces methane, 
with oxygen available produces CO2. There's also methane in the wetlands, large amounts coming out, and also, and, and you know, also, so the, there's also lots of human caused methane, like uh, natural gas is essentially methane, so fracking and uh, industrial processes are producing more and more methane. Okay, so that's the cryosphere. Now the circulation patterns, um, they can affect, uh, so southwest of North America is, is very vulnerable to very, very long-term droughts. The El Nino Southern Oscillation, or ENSO, is very susceptible to change, to uh, rapid change, to tipping, perhaps into a permanent El Nino state, um, or perhaps a much more intense El Nino state and a much weaker La Nina colder state. The West African monsoon is, is vital for agriculture and providing rainfall in Africa and the Indian um, summer monsoon. These are very vital for feeding billions of people on the planet. Um, of course, the Atlantic thermosaline, thermohaline circulation, temperature, salt-driven circulation. Think of the Gulf Stream coming up, crossing, heating Europe, cycling this way. If this uh, shuts down, it would more like likely reconfigure into, instead of a loop carrying heat up to the Arctic, it would be a sort of a half loop just in this region and everything would change in terms of heat distribution. Um, and uh, there, this, is, this, is, uh, this requires cold, salty water, which is denser than lighter, um, than, than warmer, less salty water. So as we get melt in the ice sheets, that warm water is lighter. It can shut down the, the AMOC, the Atlantic Meridional Ocean Circulation. Um, Okay, so those are the circulation patterns. There's also the biosphere components. We have the boreal forests in the far north. As, these, as we get warming, rapid warming, these things are, they can dry out, rainfall regimes change. We get huge numbers of forest fires that can take these out. And since the, if the climate has shifted, the, there's not regrowth of forests. There's, there can be savanna or grasslands replacing the boreal forest. So that changes the whole uh, uh, sink of carbon. There's also the Amazon rainforest, which is considered the lungs of the planet, if you like, on land. And then there's some marine biological carbon pumps in the ocean. This is the phytoplankton that suck carbon out of the atmosphere. Um, they're eaten. There's excrement going down. They die, they go down. It enters the, the ocean uh, food chain. Um, there's evidence showing that this is getting weaker and weaker in the southern hemisphere. And of course, tropical coral reefs not just in Australia, um, but uh, you know, these coral reefs are being decimated by very, very warm ocean temperatures of, as we've seen. So this is the biological diversity hotspot of the oceans. This is the biological diversity hotspots of the, the land. So these are all being threatened in these so-called tipping points or points of abrupt change. These are, can be points of no return. You know, if we knock out the Amazon rainforest, massive drought, say, which has occurred, you know, three years, three separate years in the last decade or so. Um, more and more um, deforestation, more and more um, fires, then if the climate regime has changed, then we replace this with the group uh, savanna or grasslands and the carbon sink becomes much weaker. So there's all of these sort of tipping points that are irreversible. You know, if, if, if that happens, you can't go back, at least not in uh, human time scales. Okay, so this is, uh, like I say, this is from the uh, Potsdam. Um, if you go to the Potsdam Institute, look up tipping element, Google tipping elements, um, the Achilles heels of the Earth system. And it explains all of these tipping elements um, some of them can be self-reinforcing or compound or cascading feedbacks. One thing happens, triggering another feedback and another feedback, and the, we're at great risk of, of crossing these tipping points. So here, this is broken down into the ice masses, and so here we go. These are all the different components, for example, and you can just click on the, this to get a, a good description of what that particular tipping element is. Um, the circulation system tipping elements and the ecosystem tipping elements. So I highly recommend that you go to this site and just look at these tipping 
uh, factors which are crucial in the Earth system, and we're already we're very rapidly approaching the loss of Arctic sea ice, and then that will cascade to Greenland and the jet streams and all of these other different factors. Okay, the Earth system is all tied together, so we're probably within I would say five years of of crossing over this Arctic sea ice tipping point. And this is why I'm saying that we have no choice but to uh, apply solar radiation management techniques to cool the Arctic and carbon dioxide removal techniques to draw CO2 down from the atmosphere while we slash emissions. Because we're in a climate change emergency, we're going to cross these tipping points. It's just a matter of time and it's not much time. I'm talking five years, you know, maybe by 2020 even for the loss of Arctic sea ice. So have a look at this site, it's excellent. Now, the recent climate report that came out, the Fourth National Climate Assessment, Volume 1, the US report that came out, I talked about it in some previous videos, but in this particular case, I'm gonna focus on Chapter 15, which are potential surprises, compound, compound extremes and tipping elements. So this is all about tipping points, um, the risks of them. Okay, so here we go, chapter 15. Um, so this is uh, cascading tipping points and tipping elements. Um, so the key findings, you know, these positive feedbacks are self-reinforcing cycles. They can accelerate human-induced climate change and shift the Earth's climate system in part or in whole into new states that are very different from those experienced in the recent past or in, in human history. Okay, we can have an Earth that is that it, so forget about this uh, expression, the new normal. We're undergoing an abrupt change and we're nowhere near the new normal. The new normal is a world that's much, much warmer than this world. Um, so some of the new states might be greatly diminished ice sheets, different large scale patterns of atmosphere and ocean circulation. Okay, so some of the feedbacks in causing these state shifts can be modeled and quantified. Others can be modeled or identified but not quantified, and some are probably still unknown. Okay, very high confidence in this. Well, this doesn't give me a lot of confidence that there's high confidence that there's all these tipping points and so on. There's incomplete knowledge about feedbacks and potential state shifts, and these things are very, very significant and severe. Key finding two, okay, you can get compound events, compound tips, so you can have a tipping event where, say, the uh, Amazon rainforest burns, it's not replaced by forest, it's replaced by grasslands, the CO2 levels spike up, um, causes excessive warming, sea level rise, you know, get suddenly Arctic sea ice goes and boom, away we're off to the races. We're barreling forward up, temperatures rise, greenhouse gas levels skyrocket. We haven't seen anything yet, we're just scratching the surface to what can happen. Um, you know, wildfires associated with hot and dry conditions, flooding, associated with high precipitation, rain on snow or waterlogged ground. So, so the result of these multiple tipping points, the result is greater than the sum of the parts with very high confidence. Okay, now these are not modeled um, very well at all. Also the key finding here is that um, not all the processes um, uh, we don't know. We haven't quantified processes. There's a lot of unknowns still. We have very high confidence that future changes outside the range projected by climate models cannot be ruled out. We need to rely less on climate models and more on observations and more on paleo records of how quickly the planet has changed in the past in order to get a proper handle on what's happening now. So. Um, we, the, there's a systematic tendency of climate models to underestimate temperature change during warm paleoclimates. So climate models, they're underestimating what's happening now, the changes that are happening now. We really need to rely more on the observations. Okay, so let's uh, move along here. Um, okay, so I'm going to so this is chapter 15 again. I'm going to talk about some of the details here. Um, and uh, since I'm running out of time for this particular video, I like to divide my videos up into 15 minute segments. I will start the next segment, part B if you like, um, on this um, particular section. Thank you.